Hi, my name is Maryam Shonechi. I'm assistant professor and Viterbi Early Career Chair in Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Southern California. And I will talk about dynamical neural modeling and inference building on what you have already learned about linear dynamical system models and common filters. So what you've seen so far are the classical linear dynamical system models, also referred to as linear state space model, in which both the state and the observation equations are linear and Gaussian. And you've seen that in this case, Kalman filters are actually optimal for state decoding or inference. So what I will do in this lecture is to build on these concepts and extend them both to gain neuroscientific insight and to develop neurotechnology. I will talk about four main topics. First, how can we extend these dynamical models and Kalman filters for multi-scale signals uh, consisting of spiking activity, local field potentials, and ECOG, which could therefore also have nonlinear observation equations as well as multiple timescales? Second, we'll talk about how we can learn accurate latent state space models to describe a given neural data set. Then we'll talk about interpretation. So once you learn these models, how do you interpret them and use them to study neural dynamics? And finally, I'll talk about applications to brain-machine interfaces for various brain states from motor to mood. Okay, so first, why do we care about multi-scale modeling? As you may know, our behavior involves brain networks, both at the small scale and at the large scale. So at the small scale, we can measure the brain using the spiking activity. And at larger scale, we can measure it using LFP, ECOG, or even EEG. So you've already seen dynamical latent state space models that are largely focused on a single scale of activity. But the question here is, can we develop state space models latent state space models that describe all of these signal scales simultaneously. Now, why is this a difficult computational problem that is different from what you've seen so far? These signals actually have very different statistical distributions and time scales. So if you look at spiking activities, these are action potential events that can be modeled as a binary time series using, for example, a Poisson or a point process. And they have fast millisecond time scales. If you think about field potentials, these are now continuous signals that have slower time scales. So what we need are novel multi-scale dynamical models that can describe how a given brain state is simultaneously represented in all of these activity scales. So how do we do this? So we've developed a multi-scale latent state space model. And to do so, we first write down the state equation, similar to what you've seen so far, we use linear dynamics. Then, given the continuous nature of the field potential features, we write an observation model that linearly relates them to the latent state. So up to here is your classical linear dynamical system model. But what we need to do additionally is to describe how the same latent state is also represented in the binary time series of the spikes. And we do that by writing down a point process model, which is fully specified in terms of its firing rate function. And we write this firing rate in terms of the same latent state. So now, of course, this is a new latent state space model. And therefore, we need new algorithms to learn the model parameters. And we need new algorithms to infer uh, the state x from simultaneously simultaneous measurements of y and n. And if we can do this, we can actually go multi-scale with our dynamical models. So the first thing to notice here is that we can't use a common filter for state estimation here, because we no longer have a linear state space model. So we develop a new multi-scale filter that runs at multiple time scales and adds information across scales. Now the derivation is in the paper I've cited here, but I'll give you some intuition about how this filter works. So the prediction step is similar to the common filter because our state equation is similar to the common filter. 
but the difference is in the update step. In particular, this filter corrects its prediction, not only based on the continuous signal observation, but also based on the discrete or binary signal observation. And that is precisely why it can aggregate information across scales. So the first thing we wanted to examine was whether this multi-scale filter works. So we first built a simple version of our model where we assumed the state was the measurable behavior itself. Actually, these versions of state space models are sometimes referred to as representational models. And in this case, because the state is measurable, we can use simple maximum likelihood to learn the model parameters. So what we were interested in was to uh, use this multi-scale filter to decode movement during a 3D reach grasp and re return task performed by non-human primates, in which they basically reached to diverse locations in 3D space, grasped an object, and then returned to a resting location. And while they were doing this, we were recording spike and LFB signals from over 130 channels across the motor cortical areas. Now, this task was naturalistic in the sense that uh, it didn't have a trial structure. They were doing this continuously and to diverse locations. And this beautiful data set has been um, recorded in Bijan Pesaran's lab at NYU with him we uh, collaborate. So, we wanted to use their multi-scale filter on this data set. Now, prior studies have actually shown successful decoding of joint angles with both spiking and LFP using Kalman filter. But what we were interested in was multi-scale filtering and then using that to study low dimensional population dynamics across scales. So applying it, what we found was that indeed our multi-scale filter could run at multiple time scale and add information from LFPs to spikes and vice versa to improve decoding accuracy. So here I'm showing you two example joint angles. Here's what the point process filter just using the spiking activity does in decoding it. And here what the multi-scale filter does. And you can see that the decoding correlation coefficient improves with multi-scale filtering for all of the joints uh, on average about 40% improvement. And interestingly, this improvement was similar whether the spike and LFP channels were fully overlapping or fully non-overlapping, meaning that even on the same channel, there was non-redundant information in spike and LFP that we could take advantage of. So this is great. This shows you one application of the multi-scale filter to quantify information and add information. But if we want to study low dimensional population dynamics, what we have to do is to develop a different version of this model, which is dynamical and in which the state is now latent. And while the behavior is a function of that state, it's not equivalent to it. So the latent nature of this uh, state introduces a challenge in fitting these model parameters. So we developed a new unsupervised learning algorithm to learn these model parameters, a multi-scale expectation maximization or EM algorithm. And it's different from the EM algorithm you've seen for linear dynamic system models because our log likelihood function is different. In particular, in this case, in the expectation step, we have to use the multi-scale filter and smoother that we've developed. And in the maximization step, we have to partially find the parameters numerically. But doing so, we can iteratively converge to the right value of the model parameters, and the details are in this paper. Okay, so now that we have this methodology, how can we use this to study uh, population dynamic across different spatial temporal scales? So the good thing is, once we learn this model to study these neural dynamics, all we need to focus on is the first equation, which basically tells you how the latent state moves from time t minus 1 to time t. And in particular, the eigenvalues of the state transition matrix, or A, specify the dynamical characteristics of your neural signal. 
the radius, uh, in general, these are complex conjugate eigenvalues whose radius basically tells you how fast neural dynamics decay in time in response to excitation. And the angle tells you with what frequency neural dynamics oscillate in time in response to excitations. So each eigenvalue corresponds to a unique pair of time decay and frequency, and together the eigenvalues um, uh, summarize the dynamical characteristics of your neural data. So we call these eigenvalues dynamical modes. And to study neural dynamics, we apply our EM algorithm, we extract the A matrix, apply an eigenvalue decomposition to extract these dynamical modes. And now because we are interested in the relationship of these modes to behavior, what we can do is to apply a similarity transform to write the state equation in a modal form. In this form, every element of the latent state is associated with one of the eigenvalues, so basically with one time decay and frequency pair. And therefore, if we decode with it, we can specify that mode's contribution to behavior. All right. So using this methodology and within our naturalistic 3D reach and grasp movement task, what we wanted to study was what is the relationship between small scale spiking and large scale LFP population dynamics and how they explain naturalistic movements. So first we applied our methodology to spikes and LFP separately. So here is the eigenvalue diagram for the spiking activity. And you can see that the methodology identifies various dynamical modes. And if we look at the joint prediction accuracy, you can see that some modes have no information about behavior hovering around a zero correlation coefficient. But there exists one dynamical mode that is strongly dominant in its prediction of behavior compared to the other modes. So we did the same to LFB on its own. And again, the methodology found various dynamical modes, some of which were distinct uh, from the spike modes. And they had varying levels of joint prediction accuracy. But again, there was one uh, dynamical mode that was strongly dominant in uh, predicting behavior. For example, here is the shoulder elevation prediction using that single predictive mode in spiking activity. So now let's look at these dynamical modes side by side. What you'll see is that despite the fact that there are distinct modes in spikes and LFP, this predictive mode is at a very similar location, meaning it has similar dynamical time decay and oscillation frequency characteristics. Now the first concern we wanted to rule out was that perhaps there was this mode that was dominant in behavior and therefore represented in our neural signals. So we applied the same methodology on behavior and extracted dynamical modes of behavior in gray. And if you compare these to the, to the predictive mode that we find, you see that this concern did not hold, meaning the behavior modes, first of all, had slower time decays, second of all, had a much wider frequency range. So this seems to imply that it, there exists a dynamical mode that is shared across scales and critical in explaining naturalistic movement. Now, to provide further evidence for this, we said that if this is indeed the case, we should find this exact same mode if we put spikes and LFPs together and build a single multiscale model. And indeed, that is what happened. So this provides converging evidence that there exists a shared mode, a multiscale predictive mode that explain naturalistic movements. And I want to emphasize that these three models are completely different. Their learning algorithms are different, yet we again and again find the same mode. Interestingly, even across our two animals, we again find the same multiscale predictive mode, meaning it's at a very similar location, providing further evidence about its importance in naturalistic movements. Now, this mode had a time decay of about a second and an oscillation frequency of about 0.2 hertz. And there's a lot that we can say in terms of interpretation of this in the context of naturalistic movements, but that is beyond the scope of this lecture. 
Okay. So, so far what I've shown you is that neural dynamics are actually important in explaining behavior. But the next question was that given their importance, can we develop novel methods that can dissociate and model those neural dynamics that are behaviorally relevant? So what do I mean by this? So let's look at a typical neuroscience experiment. We have um, some neural recordings, we have some behavior we're measuring, and we're trying to find a relationship. So we need the latent state models. We assume there are certain latent states that give rise to our neural recordings and our behavior. Now, the issue is that not, uh, not all of the latent states that describe your recorded neural activity relate to the behavior that you're studying. For example, if you're studying movements here, some of these states may uh, relate to other factors like our emotions or how hungry or thirsty we are. Similarly, if you think about the latent state that give rise to behavior or equivalently the behavior dynamics, not all of these are necessarily represented in your neural recordings. So what we're really interested in is to extract the shared dynamics between neural activity and behavior, basically the green part, which is the behaviorally relevant latent states. But our current method can't really directly learn these behaviorally relevant states. Let's see why. So if we think about unsupervised methods, such as the expectation maximization algorithm that we can use to train neurodynamic models or NDM models, these models first completely ignore behavior and try to find latent state to best describe neural activity. Now, in doing so, they may actually learn latent states that are not behaviorally relevant. And indeed, these latent states, basically the red parts, can potentially mask or confound the behaviorally relevant latent states, so the green part. Now, if you think about representational modeling, these models also describe dynamics, but they ignore neural dynamics. And the dynamics that they describe is actually the dynamics in behavior. But by doing so, they may actually learn behavior dynamics that are not even represented in your neural activity recording. So you can see that these methods cannot really give us the green part, which is the shared dynamics between neural activity and behavior, or, or, or equivalently, the behaviorally relevant latent states in neural activity. So we developed a new method, preferential subspace identification, that can dissociate and model these green states. And I'll briefly talk about it, but the details are in the, in the preprint that you can check out if you're interested. So again, PSID uses the latent state space model. But the difference is that PSID can actually dissociate the latent state elements that are behaviorally relevant from those latent state elements that are not behaviorally relevant and give rise to neural activity. And what's important about PSID is that it can actually prioritize the extraction of the behaviorally relevant neural state, meaning it can extract them without even worrying about other states. And this is key to its success, both extracting these states more accurately and with much lower dimensions. So what's the intuition behind the methodology? Well, the intuition is that a behaviorally relevant latent state in neural activity should summarize what we know about future behavior based on past neural activity. So if we project future behavior onto past neural activity, we can extract these behaviorally relevant states in that subspace and fit the model parameters and learn their dynamics. Okay, so what can we use PSID for? What are the neuroscience questions that we can use PSID to answer? So one important question across domains of neuroscience is what, are, what is the dimensionality of the behaviorally relevant neural dynamics or neural manifold? So we said, okay, let's use PSID and NDM to extract this dimensionality and compare them. 
So how do we do this? We fit a latent state space model using NVM and using PS, uh, one using NVM, one using PSIE at different state dimensions. Then we do behavior decoding with these states and look at behavior decoding accuracy. And we ask, well, at what dimension did behavior decoding saturate? And that is the dimensionality revealed by each of these methods uh, about behaviorally relevant neural dynamics. So what we find interestingly is that compared to other methods, PSID reveals a much lower dimensionality. So five versus 25 to 27 for behaviorally relevant dynamics. And not only that, it could do much better behavior decoding, not only at that low dimension, but also it could do better behavior decoding even compared to a higher dimensional NDM model. So what this implies is that PSID can much more accurately extract the behaviorally relevant neural dynamics and reveal their lower dimensionality. And this held regardless of which joint angle we looked at and regardless of which brain area or recording channel we looked at. So if you have an application in which you're interested in neural dynamics that explain a given behavior, PSID will be quite useful to, to use. All right, so what are the other questions? Another important question across domains of neuroscience is what are the temporal patterns of neural dynamics during a given task? And usually the way people study this is to use dimensionality reduction and typically, basically they project the neural data onto two dimensional planes such that they can plot it, visualize it and look at it. So we said, okay, let's use NDM and PSID for this purpose and compare them. Now uh, we can do this simply by fitting a two dimensional latent state space model using NDM and using PSID. And both of them allow us to do dynamic dimensionality reduction to take into account temporal structure in contrast to, for example, static methods such as PCA. So we fit a two dimensional latent state space model one with NDM, one with PSID, and then within cross-validation, we plot the two states against each other. So here's what we see with NDM during the reach and return movements. You can see that NDM extracts these neural rotations during reach and return, and these rotations have been observed in the motor cortex in many uh, prior studies as well, and we find them in the, the 3D task. But what's interesting is that despite the fact that the movement is changing direction during reach and return, the neural rotations revealed by NDM maintain the same direction. So this is intuitively a little bit strange. So we said, okay, now let's apply PSID. So doing PSID, we again find rotations during reach and return. But this time, the neural rotations actually change direction just as the movement changes direction during the reach and return. Now, intuitively, this implies that the left rotations are more behaviorally relevant. But we wanted to confirm this quantitatively using decoding accuracy in cross-validation. And indeed, we found that the rotation revealed by PSID were better at decoding behavior than the rotations revealed by NDM. And what this implies is that PSID can allow you to do dynamic dimensionality reduction while preserving behavior information. So you may ask me, how is it possible that both these types of rotations coexist in the same exact neural data set? So I'm going to show this with a representative uh, hypothetical cartoon. So let's say we have three neural signals, and let's say their dynamics evolves on this simple bent ring manifold in 3D space. So we want to do dimensionality reduction. What we would do is to project the same traversal on different two-dimensional planes. Now, if we project this on the y1, y2 plane, we're going to find rotations that have the same direction. If we project it on Y2, Y3 plane, we're going to find rotations that change direction. 
So you can see that there are various dynamic, um, um, dynamic dimensionality reduction uh, and projections possible in a high dimensional space. And what PSID does, it, it finds you the dynamic projection that again, preserves behavior information. All right, so finally, all of the latent state space models we've talked about so far did not incorporate the effect of an external input. But of course, if we want to manipulate or control brain activity, it's important to describe how external inputs such as electrical or optogenetic stimulation also drives neural dynamics. Now, I'm not going to go into any detail about this, but we have actually extended these latent state space model to incorporate the effect of electrical stimulation input. We have trained these models by applying novel stochastic binary noise stimulation patterns to the brain and recording the response and modeling it. And we have shown that indeed these models can predict the neural dynamics in response to stimulation. So basically the input driven dynamics. And if you're interested about this input output or IO models, you can refer to the references that I've cited here. Okay, so before I end, I just want to also briefly talk about some of the applications of these methodologies to brain-machine interfaces from motor to mood. So the first application is for motor BMIs, which you've already actually seen. And this field started about two decades ago, and there's been significant work and progress done on motor BCIs since. So what we wanted to study was whether the nonlinear filters that I've shown you uh, can also be used to develop a closed loop uh, BMI. So actually, a couple of years ago, we constructed a point process filter BMI for spiking activity and tested it in non-human primate experiments in Jose Carmina's lab. Here, the monkey basically had its arm restrained and he was controlling the position of this cursor based on only its neural activity. And you can see that through this point process filter, it can actually perform this movement task pretty, uh, pretty accurately, both in the obstacle avoidance task on the left and the center task on the, on the right. And indeed, what we found was that modeling the binary nature of the spikes and their fast millisecond time scale using the point process filter enhanced BMI uh, control. Now, as an interesting link to tomorrow's lectures, we actually train this point process filter using an optimal feedback control model of the BMI that we had constructed. And of course, you will learn much more about um, optimal feedback control models tomorrow, but I've listed some um, references on the BMI side, uh, on the BMI side of things below if you're interested. Okay, so the other application that we can think about is to develop a next generation of BMIs that instead of restoring lost motor function, aim to restore lost emotional function in mental disorders such as depression. Indeed, in collaboration with Eddie Chang's lab at UCSF, we obtained human intracranial brain activity. And then we developed dynamic modeling and dimensionality reduction techniques. And using those, we showed that we can decode um, mood symptom variations in an individual patient uh, over time. And this is important because it opens the possibility of adjusting and optimizing, tailoring our therapies in real time based on, say, the mood symptom state of a given patient. And our eventual vision here is to develop a fully closed loop BMI for deep brain stimulation therapy in mental disorder, where we would use a neural decoder to estimate mental states such as mood symptoms and use that as feedback to adjust the stimulation therapy parameters. Now to build the decoder, of course, these dynamical models of mood encoding are critical. And to build the feedback controller, the input output dynamical models that I mentioned are critical. So together, 
we are hoping that by building these closed loop control systems, we can improve the quality of care and improve efficacy of these treatments for tens of millions of patients who are suffering from mental disorders. Okay, so in conclusion, I talked about various topics. First, I talked about extending the Kalman filters and dynamical models for multi-scale signals. About, um, then I talked about learning dynamic latent state space models and dynamic dimensionality reduction to extract behaviorally relevant neural dynamics. I talked about how we interpret these dynamical models, for example, in terms of multi-scale uh, dynamical modes. I talked about how we can extend these to describe the effect of external electrical stimulation input. And finally, I talked about a next generation of mood BMIs that we can potentially develop for mental disorders. And of course, there's much, much more work to be done on this front. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the lab members uh, uh, who, whose work I presented in the slides, as well as um, the funding sources, and thank you for your attention.